Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, thanks for being here with me. So, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, about my uh, past and my sort of journey and then the ideas that I've explored and then kind of what I'm doing with them um, at this point. And uh, as Charles men mentioned, you know, my, my main work has been as an author. I wrote a book called Breaking Open the Head that was about shamanism and psychedelic substances, uh, especially as they're used in different tribal cultures around the world. Uh, I went to visit uh, cultures in West Africa and Ecuador and the Amazon and, and Mexico and so on. Um, and I also um, wrote after that a book called 2012, Return of Quetzalcoatl, that kind of looked into the prophecies and foretellings that a lot of uh, indigenous cultures have about the time that, that we're in now. Um, and I also made a film, 2012 Time for Change, um, which is, is available through a lot of uh, forms. So yeah, so, so, so my background, um, in, my, in my 20s I was a journalist, I was living in New York City, which is where I'm from, I had a kind of existential crisis, a kind of spiritual emergency, and um, really it just seemed that um, the culture of New York was extremely uh, materialistic and, and sort of nihilistic, and uh, I'd started writing about uh, environmental subjects, um, I did a piece about the decline of the um, sperm count, uh, which was due to toxic chemicals that are collect and collecting in our, in our uh, endocrine system and blood and so on uh, through plastics and pesticides and so on. So as I began to explore these subjects, I became aware that um, there was kind of like a, a lack of ability for people to focus on these, uh, you know, critical things that seem to be happening to, to the planet. Um, and, and in a sense, like I think because the culture was kind of nihilistic and, and has, has the basic belief that consciousness is only brain-based and there's no kind of existence of any type of soul or spirit after death, um, there's kind of a, a sense that the future is not that important or something. Um, so at that point I really went into my own kind of existential and spiritual uh, dilemma and, you know, because I'd grown up in a scientific materialist background, and I'd also kind of um, accepted this idea that there couldn't be an existence of a soul or a consciousness outside of the physical body. But I realized that even though that's what my culture had told to me up to that point, I really didn't know, you know, personally, you know, let's say ontologically or experientially, you know, whether or not that was the case. So at that point I was in my late 20s, and I remembered, you know, when, when I sort of like was in this crisis, I looked back through my history up to that point, and I remembered my psychedelic experiences back in college as the most significant um, kind of um, incidents that suggested to me that there were these other forms of consciousness, other dimensions of being and experiencing that our modern culture was not allowing us to know or to explore. So now that I was an adult and a journalist and I could write for the New York Times and Rolling Stone and so on, I started to get assignments to explore uh, shamanism and these different uh, substances. And uh, I was very lucky to get an assignment to uh, go to West Africa uh, and go through a Bwiti initiation. There's a tribe in Gabon called the Bwiti that use a substance called uh, Iboga or Ibogaine, uh, as it's known in the West, uh, is, is their kind of a visionary sacrament. And uh, how many people here have heard of Iboga? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. So one of the exciting things about, about my journey, I and mean, that first book came out in 2002, and I've been, you know, get, witnessing the spread of understanding and information and knowledge around all these substances and practices, um, which is thrilling to see, you know, um, as, as that grows. So yeah, so, so I, had the, that, I had the luck of being able to go to West Africa and go through a tribal initiation uh, with the Bwiti, taking, uh, taking Iboga, which is being used in the West uh, as an experimental treatment for addictions. Do people know that? Um, yeah. It's being used to treat heroin addictions, and I think a couple of other speakers mentioned that also. Um, and I have uh, some friends who have actually gotten off heroin, which is extremely difficult to do, uh, through using Iboga or Ibogaine several times uh, in, in, in uh, kind of therapy context. So, so, um, so I went to yeah, West Africa, and um, I mean, I write about this obviously in depth in, in the book Breaking Open the Head. But I had a series of experiences through exploring shamanism that, that over time shifted me, converted me from the materialist worldview, uh, the scientific uh, kind of sterile perspective that I'd begun with, 
to, to an acceptance that reality was much more multidimensional and multi-leveled and, and that there were these kind of um, aspects of the psyche uh, that somebody like Carl Jung uh, talks about. Um, you know, that, that, that there was in a sense, uh, you know, a psychic reality that, that was beyond what we, you know, maybe necessarily experience in our day-to-day -day lives. And this larger psychic reality kind of uh, expresses itself to us and through us in events like uh, synchronicities or intuitive uh, foreknowings, foreknow foretellings. And, and as I began to do the research for Breaking Open the Head, um, it just became more and more clear to me that the modern world had somehow um, forfeited, let's say, a huge aspect of what for indigenous and ancient cultures is considered so crucial and so important, which are all these other aspects or dimensions of the psyche, uh, the visionary, the intuitive, you know, the, the magical, and so on. And, th and that as I explored these, I discovered that, that as far as I could understand from my own experience, they were true. Um, so, and, and this is, as I said, laid out in the book, and it's hard to, well, how many people here uh, believe that humans have psychic capacities? Believe? And how many people here don't? Okay, interesting. Yeah, so, so, so I think we're becoming, a, you know, we're becoming aware, and that's why I can speak to an audience like this at maybe a higher level even than, than a few years ago, because that, that, that evolution of consciousness, especially in these types of communities, is, is taking place and, and happening uh, in an accelerated way, you know? Uh, and I, by the way, before I go further, I do want to express tremendous gratitude for Boom, uh, for the people who put this amazing uh, festival together. It is such an extremely beautiful work of art. Um, Yeah, I, I really feel like the festival has become one of the most like profound, uh, you know, art forms of our time in a way, and, and I've never seen one, you know, with such scrupulous attention to detail and thought and, and you know, composting toilets and, you know, next level and on so many levels. So, so, so anyway, yeah, so, so I guess um, from writing Breaking Open the Head um, and having these psychic and shamanic experiences with cultures like the Sequoia in the Amazon and the Buidi in, in Africa, um, I also began to learn that there were a lot of cultures around the world who have understandings of this time as a prophetic uh, transition or changeover. Uh, for instance, for uh, you know, indigenous cultures of um, you know, North and South America, some of them talk about it as the fourth world to the fifth world, <clears throat> or the age of the fifth sun to the age of the sixth sun. So, you know, having understood that the modern West, for whatever reasons, had forfeited and suppressed and lost uh, these other aspects of the psyche that these other cultures valued so highly and, and which we had rejected so, you know, drastically and, and even violently. If you think about things like the Inquisition, you know, where we actually s sought out, you know, in Europe, our own people who had, you know, wise women, witches, who had plant knowledge, who had visionary knowledge, and burned them at the stake. You know, and then when we became imperialists, everywhere we went into the world, we sought out the traditional knowledge holders and, and, and we killed them or we subjected their knowledge to ridicule or we destroyed the books of those cultures like we did with the Aztecs and the Maya as much as we could. Um, so that's kind of the lineage and the heritage that we're, we're coming from. <clears throat> How, however, I mean, I would say that, uh, well, let me, just, let me just continue my little story. Um, so, so, so from discovering that um, shamanism and, and these other practices had validity, I then recognized that um, a lot of these cultures around the world understand this time as a time of transition or prophecy. So I then made it my mission for the next four or five years to try to understand what this prophecy was and how could we, because they speak, these cultures speak in a, in a, in a language of, of myth and story, and, and how could we take what they express in those ways and bring it into our modern way of understanding. Uh, and for me, that path led through uh, philosophy. Uh, so I ended up incorporating a lot of philosophy into 2012 that include thinkers like Nietzsche and Heidegger and uh, Carl Jung, uh, Rudolf Steiner, and, and a very amazing Austrian philosopher called uh, Jean Gebser, uh, who wrote a book called The Ever-Present Origin about uh, the nature of time and our perceptions of it. Um, so, so essentially, the first thing that I want to say is, you know, I do not think that December 21st, 2012 is the end of the world.